Have you ever wondered how Americans first heard about the momentous events of D-Day during World War II? Let's dive into the past and explore the powerful role that radio broadcasts played in shaping the way Americans experienced history. Setting the scene on June 6, 1944, the pivotal day known as D-Day, when Allied forces launched a massive invasion of Normandy, France. This operation marked a turning point in World War II, leading to the eventual defeat of Nazi Germany. During the 1940s, radio was a primary source of news and entertainment in American homes. Families gathered around their radios, eagerly tuning in to the latest updates. As news of D-Day began to trickle in, the nation held its breath, listening intently to reports from the European front. Radio stations across the United States played a crucial role in delivering real-time information to the public. Broadcasters became the voices of authority, narrating the unfolding events with a mix of urgency and gravity. The emotional intensity of these broadcasts resonated with listeners, drawing them into the heart of the action. Quotes and excerpts from actual radio broadcasts captured the raw emotions of the moment, painting a vivid picture of the sacrifices made by Allied troops. As news spread from state to state, Americans shared in a collective experience, united in their support for the troops fighting overseas. The legacy of D-Day radio broadcasts transcends time, illustrating the power of communication technology in shaping historical events. By tuning into these broadcasts, Americans were not just passive listeners, but active participants in the unfolding drama of war. Conclusion. As we reflect on the significance of D-Day and the impact of radio broadcasts on American audiences, we are reminded of the enduring power of communication in shaping our understanding of history. The stories shared over the airwaves connected people across vast distances, offering a glimpse into the courage and sacrifice of those who fought for freedom. I encourage you to delve deeper into the history of D-Day and wartime broadcasts to gain a richer appreciation for the experiences of that era. Thank you for joining us today as we explored this fascinating chapter of our past. Remember, to stay updated on more historical content and insights, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the stories that shape our world. Subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. CBS World News, Bob Trout speaking. And again, we bring you the available report, all of them from German sources, on what the Berlin radio calls the invasion. There is still no Allied confirmation from any source. Correspondents who rushed to the War Department in Washington soon after the first German broadcast was heard were told that our War Department had no information on the German report. There's been no announcement of any sort from Allied headquarters in London. The first news of the German announcement reached this country at 12.37 a.m. Eastern Wartime. The Associated Press recorded this broadcast and immediately pointed out that it could be one which Allied leaders have warned us to expect from the Germans. Shortly after 1 a.m. Eastern Wartime, the Berlin radio opened its news program with a so-called invasion announcement. Columbia shortwave listening station here in New York heard the Berlin radio say, and I quote, Here is a special bulletin. Early this morning, the long-awaited British and American invasion began when paratroops landed in the area of the Somme estuary. The harbor of La Havre is being fiercely bombarded at the present moment. Naval forces of the German Navy are off the coast fighting with enemy landing vessels. We've just brought you a special bulletin. End of the quotation. That is the invasion announcement as heard from the Berlin radio by Columbia shortwave listening station. Now here's what Transocean, one of the German news agencies, says, and I quote, Early Tuesday morning, landing craft and light warships were observed in the area between the mouth of the Somme and the eastern coast of Normandy. At the same time, paratroops were dropped from numerous aircraft on the northern tip of the Normandy Peninsula. It is believed that these paratroops have been given the task of capturing airfields in order to facilitate the landing of further troops. The harbor of La Havre is at the moment being bombarded. And, continues the broadcast, German naval forces have engaged enemy landing craft off the coast. The Transocean broadcast, still unconfirmed, concludes this way. 
the long-expected Anglo-American invasion appears to have begun. This is the full text of the German Transocean broadcast as recorded by the Associated Press. The German broadcasts on the long-expected invasion by the Allies were relayed both to North America and to Germans in the homeland. Germans at home were told by DNB's domestic broadcast at dawn in Europe. At 1.30 in the morning, Eastern wartime, the DNB agency repeated the items describing what it called the invasion operation. This was a departure from the usual DNB practice of giving fresh information at that time. The German-controlled Calais radio came on the air today with this announcement in the English language, quote, This is D-Day. We shall now bring music for the Allied invasion forces. So said the German-controlled Calais radio across the channel from England. Up to this time, almost an hour and a half after the first German broadcast, the United States Office of War Information, whose facilities will be used by American press organizations when Allied armies enter Western Europe, has not transmitted any information at all to support the German claims. Director Elmer Davis of the OWI rushed to his headquarters immediately when OWI officials advised him of the broadcast from Germany. He told the United Press, We have no more information than you have. I'll stay here until I find out whether the story is true or not. Last night, Elmer Davis addressed the National Press Club on psychological warfare and showed three motion pictures illustrating how the OWI was propagandizing on the war front. He had just reached his home when his office called him to hurry down. By 1.45 in the morning, Eastern War Time, almost the entire public relations staff over at the War Department in Washington also had reported for duty. Now, it should be remembered, of course, that the Germans are quite capable of faking this entire series of reports. Their main reason for doing so, in addition to trying to smoke out Allied plans, would be to try to start a premature uprising by the resistance movement along the Channel Coast. But the French and the Belgians and the Dutch have all been warned about this possibility repeatedly. And you will recall that Prime Minister Winston Churchill some time ago warned that we could expect false alarms or diversionary feints before the big show began. The British radio, which at 1 a.m. Eastern wartime sent a warning to residents of the Dutch coast to evacuate inland to a distance of at least 18 miles, might merely have been broadcasting the latest in the series of such warnings that have been given to the civilian populations all along the so-called invasion coast of Europe. No other British report that might indicate that the invasion is on has been released unless we are to take as significant the report from London half an hour ago that the Royal Air Force was over enemy territory during the night. Even on the enemy side, there are clear reasons for doubting the German report that the invasion has started. The Paris radio at 1 a.m. Eastern wartime said nothing about any invasion operations in its regular news report. In fact, half an hour after the first German broadcast announcing the landings, one German-controlled Paris radio spokesman said of the war situation, and this is a quotation, it appears we have been given another month of grace before the invasion will start. A press report from Washington says Roosevelt will come to London at the end of June. Surely this indicates the event will not start before the end of June, said the Paris radio. Well, as I said, there is as yet no reason to believe the German story. Nevertheless, because of high public interest in this country... Columbia is planning to continue overtime operations tonight to all of its affiliate stations until such time as the enemy accounts are proved false or official word from Allied sources is forthcoming. You may listen to this network with assurance that all sources of news will be properly labeled and that we will interrupt programs only with news of exceptional importance and will bring you frequent summaries of all information available. The Columbia Shortwave Listening Station here in New York has heard the British radio report the German announcement of paratroop landings and report the announcement without comment. Then BBC followed that German announcement, which I've already given you, with this, and I quote, Early this morning, people in German-occupied Western Europe received an urgent warning broadcast by a spokesman of the Supreme Command of the Allied Expeditionary Force. It was that a new phase of the Allied air offensive has begun. 
people living within 22 miles of the coast are particularly affected. The German, the German Overseas News Agency, BBC goes on, has been putting out repeated flashes. Here is one of them. Quote, we have just learned that numerous Allied landing craft and other Allied warships were seen in the area between the Seine estuary and the eastern coast of Normandy. And that was BBC quoting the German report. And now here in the studio with me is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott, and here is Major Elliott now. We must uh, begin by assuming the, or by understanding the possibility that these German reports may be an outright German lie. We must also take into account the possibility that they may be a series of feints intended to divert the German defense and to throw the, draw the German forces to other places than those in which we actually intend to make a serious attack. The report that a new phase of the Allied air offensive has begun and the consequent uh, request to uh, the inhabitants of Western Europe to clear an area 22 miles from the coast may mean nothing more than an intensification of bombing attacks or it may indicate the use of paratroops or it may be, again, a part of the Allied attempt to throw the Germans off their guard. But if we are to accept these German reports as having any value at all, there seems to be some uncertainty as to the location of the Allied landings in France, which they report. It is clear that the Germans are saying that landing craft have been observed approaching the French coast, between the eastern shore of what they call the Normandy Peninsula and the mouth of the River Seine, where the port of Le Havre is situated. The Germans are also asserting that this port, Le Havre, is being bombarded and that Allied paratroops are being landed near the tip of the Normandy Peninsula. What is not clear is the reference made to an Allied landing near the estuary of the River Somme which is some distance northeast of Le Havre. This may possibly be an error for the Seine estuary, though the actual German uh, translation has been checked several times here in a CBS shortwave listening station. But to analyze all this uh, German, all these German statements, what the Germans call the Normandy Peninsula is undoubtedly the Cotentin Peninsula, at the end of which stands the port of Sherbert. Allied forces would certainly wish, if they were actually landing in France, to obtain a well-equipped seaport as soon as possible, as such a port is essential in order to keep up continuous landings of troops and heavy equipment. We learned at Anzio and at elsewhere that it is not safe to leave such matters to the mercy of the weather, as has to be done when dependence is had on open beaches or even small but undeveloped bays. Hence, a double Allied attempt against the two chief ports of, northeastern, of northern France, Sherbert and Le Havre, is well within the, within the possibilities if we are to accept the German reports that landings are taking place at all. From the strategic point of view, there is nothing inconsistent in the report of the landing at the Somme estuary. There is no seaport of importance there, but the Allies might well wish to land on a broad front in order to divert the German defense as much as possible and to keep the Germans from finding out, as long as we could, where the main effort was being made. The landing of paratroops behind the big seaport of Cherbourg would likewise be probable if the landing was really in progress in order to cut off the movement of German reserves toward that port and thus facilitate its capture by the Allies. But any military analysis must remain fragmentary and uncertain as long as it is based only on German reports which have so frequently proved to be unreliable in the past. That was Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott, and I think that brings us up to date to the moment. I'd like to repeat that there is as yet no reason to believe this German story which you have now heard. Nevertheless, because of high public interest in this country, Colombia is planning to continue overtime operations tonight, and I should like to take this opportunity 
to inform not only you, our audience, but to inform also the staffs on duty at our affiliate stations around the country that Columbia is planning overtime operations until such time as the enemy accounts are proved false or official word from Allied sources is forthcoming. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you may listen to this network with assurance that all sources of news will be properly labeled and that we will interrupt programs only with news of exceptional importance and will bring you frequent summaries of all information available. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. CBS World News, Bob Trout speaking. It has now been nearly two hours since the first German radio announcement that the invasion had begun. Frankly, we don't know at this time whether those German news agency reports that the invasion has begun are true or not. However, the scarcity of any details from the Germans in these two hours after the first announcement do throw very strong doubt on the possible truth of the German story. Up until this moment, of course, there's been no confirmation from any Allied source that an invasion may have started. Elmer Davis, director of the Office of War Information, says that he, too, knows nothing of the reports. However, late last night, three German news agencies flashed word that Allied paratroops were spilling out of the skies over the Normandy Peninsula of France and that our landing craft had started to come ashore in the Le Havre area, just 80 miles across the English Channel from the coast of Britain. The Germans, still without confirmation, say that Allied flyers are pounding Le Havre and its surrounding territory. The German news agency, DNB, also is telling of strong bombing attacks against the Calais and Dunkirk regions of France. Both Calais and Dunkirk lie some 150 miles northeast of La Havre. This is the way the German Transocean broadcast announced the start of the invasion, and I quote, The long-awaited invasion, said the Germans, by the British and Americans, was begun in the first hours of the morning of June 6th. The Germans then go on to say that their naval forces are now engaged in opposing the Allied landings. According to the German DNB agency, no enemy troops have come ashore yet. But again, I repeat, there's absolutely nothing at the moment to substantiate these enemy claims. The British Broadcasting Corporation, meanwhile, has broadcast urgent instructions to the people of France that a new phase in the air war has begun. In an earlier broadcast from Allied headquarters in London, the peoples of occupied Europe were told that once the invasion had started, they would be notified by leaflets. And again, in closing... Let me remind you that there is no Allied confirmation of the landings in France as the Germans report. The British radio did add a warning to all persons to evacuate the 22-mile coastal belt as soon as possible. Both Axis and Allied sources mention Allied air activity over the entire coastal area from Norway to central France. Although there's no reason to believe this enemy report, the Columbia Network will remain in overtime operation tonight until all the facts are known. We repeat, the network will operate beyond its regular time of closing until the German report has either been verified or has been proved erroneous. This program has come to you from CBS World News. We resume our scheduled program. It's now almost two and a half hours since the Germans first broadcast their claims that what they call the Allied invasion had begun. There's no confirmation from any Allied source, and the Germans are not telling this story to their own people. That's very important. General Eisenhower's spokesman has made no official statement. The War Department in Washington says it has no information about any invasion operations. The OWI is silent. In short, there is no reason to believe the continuing German reports of an Allied invasion. Nevertheless, here are the latest details of what the Germans claim is the great Anglo-American invasion. The German Transocean News Agency, a Nazi propaganda outlet, said at about 12.30 Eastern wartime that Allied parachute troops had started to land on the northern tip of the Normandy Peninsula. At the same time, Allied warships were said to be shelling the port of La Havre at the estuary of the Seine River. Berlin said a naval battle between German and Allied light naval units was in progress. 
The official German news agency, DNB, quickly picked up the report and added that the Allied invasion attack appeared to be concentrated in the area between the mouth of the Seine River and the east coast of Normandy. Continuing reports from the Berlin radio say that heavy fleets of Allied bombers are attacking Dunkirk and Calais. The Oslo radio network appears to have gone off the air, and the Luxembourg radio claims that Allied aircraft are approaching southern Germany. Meanwhile, in Great Britain, the British radio has broadcast a warning to the peoples of the occupied countries that a new phase of the air war has started. The British announcement says that occupants of coastal towns will be notified by leaflets dropped from planes when they are to be attacked. The notices may come as little as an hour before the attack, and the inhabitants are warned to leave their towns instantly without waiting to take baggage or any possessions. In addition, the inhabitants of the 22-mile-wide belt along the invasion coast have been warned to leave as soon as possible in preparation for this new and drastic phase of the aerial bombardment. But, as yet, there is no word that any warning leaflets have been dropped on any towns within the so-called invasion area. This is merely an advanced warning of things to come. Incidentally, Germany has beamed reports of the supposed invasion to Asia, but, as yet, the Japanese radio has not picked up these reports. After the first German story about the so-called invasion, the man who is called Captain Ludwig Sertorius, supposedly a military commentator for the German news agency, the German news agency Transocean, declared flatly that the great conquest, as he put it, has begun between forces of the Reich and those of the Anglo-Americans. He said that Allied landings in the West today had put the German armed forces in the mood which they express with a laconic, they are coming. He then went on to say that at the present moment, the invasion of Western Europe is at its very beginning, and that nothing can yet be said about the tactical and operational developments. This almost an apology for the lack of details. Sertorius then concluded that the German armies are facing the Allied onslaught with single-mindedness of purpose. For in war, said the captain, with the typical Berlin flourish, ethical values are at least as important as the number of soldiers and the quantity of their equipment. Washington, like the rest of the nation, is momentarily waiting for official word from our side about these German claims. The city of Washington awoke rapidly after the first broadcasts more than three hours ago. Lights flashed on and radios were tuned in. You may have had the same experience. Newsmen hurried to their offices, and there was just one question on everyone's lips. Is it official? So far, as we've told you repeatedly, it is not official. If the White House knows anything about the report, there is no sign. Only a few lights glow here and there, and the customary guards are patrolling up and down outside the White House with the same old monotony. Only a few hours earlier, President Roosevelt addressed the nation by radio. He spoke of the fall of Rome, and he said it was a significant victory. But the president added that a long period of greater effort and fighting lies ahead before we get into Germany itself. <clears throat> Elmer Davis, director of the Office of War Information, hurried down to his office in Washington as soon as he heard about the German broadcasts. But he says, we have no more information than you have. I'll stay here until I find out whether the story is true or not. Over at the War Department in the Pentagon building, the lights are burning brightly in the public relations office. And for almost an hour now, practically the entire public relations staff has been on the job. But the War Department says it still has no information. That is about the entire story as far as we know it at the moment. At this point, there's no way in which any of us can know whether there's even a faint spark of truth behind this German story. We don't know. But there are several bits of evidence suggesting that the Germans are trying some kind of trick. We'll have to wait until later before we can be sure. Since the first German report came in about 30 minutes after midnight, Eastern War Time, we've been on the air several times here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York, repeating the facts we know and giving you whatever news has come in. At this point, our Columbia newsroom is a scene of activity rather unusual at this time of the morning, after 3 Eastern War Time. The news machines of the United Press, the Associated Press, the International News Service, and so on, which usually, at this hour, are slowly, calmly printing more or less routine news for afternoon papers, are now hammering out every scrap of information from Europe they can get. 
But even so, there are sometimes long pauses because of the way in which the Germans have put this story out. And now it might be a good idea to take you on a little three o'clock in the morning tour of Columbia's newsroom. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to stand up from this table in the studio in which I've been broadcasting, open the door, take the microphone in my hand, and walk out into Columbia's newsroom, trailing the long cable behind me. And when we get out in our newsroom, we're now crossing the threshold, I'll read off to you some of the news machines and give you an idea just what they're printing at this hour of this unusual morning. Columbia's news staff has been quickly assembled, and so many staff members appeared so quickly that there are scarcely chairs enough for all members at once. Ned Kalmer, who finished his 11 o'clock broadcast about four hours ago, is still here. Major George Fielding Elliott hurried in, among others, and Major Elliott brought with him a very large supply of maps, as you can well imagine. In one of our offices, the radio is permanently tuned tonight to a London circuit so that we can hear whatever comes over on this particular circuit. A table has quickly been set up and now bears large cups of coffee, the inevitable accompaniment to all stories that break abruptly in the night. In some ways, the scene is not unlike those hard-working nights when the Germans were rushing through Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries, and France. But there's an awful lot of difference. Even though we're suspicious of this German story, and we think that the invasion very possibly has not begun, still the atmosphere in this newsroom tonight is far different from that on those anxious nights when the Germans were on the offensive. And now I've walked with the microphone down to the end of our newsroom, and the first machine that we come to is the brown teletype printer, which turns out the reports from Reuters. That's the British news agency. And here's what Reuters has just printed. London, Reuters, an officer of the staff of the Allied Supreme Command of the Expeditionary Force, today broadcast a warning specially addressed to all Frenchmen living at least within 35 kilometers of the coast. He said, the lives of many depend upon the speed with which you act. And then there was a brief pause, and then Reuter continued, warning too. Quote, the air war has entered upon a new phase. This, of course, is what the spokesman said. The air war has entered upon a new phase. You will be warned an hour before an attack. Leaflets will be dropped by Allied planes. As soon as you get the warning, go to your domicile and go at least two kilometers from it into the open country. Two, take along only what you can easily carry. Three, keep off all roads, railway lines, and bridges. Four, do not form groups which could be mistaken for troop concentration. That's what Reuters is printing at the moment, and as all newsmen will recognize, the inevitable little postscript, the machine says, correction and warning two, read it, carry, paragraph three, keep off all roads. Next is the machine of the International News Service, and it has just been printing a dispatch from London by Kingsbury Smith. It says, bulletin by Kingsbury Smith, International News Service staff correspondent, London, May 6, INS. German sources reported today that the Allies had launched the long-awaited invasion of the continent by landing parachutists in northern France and assaulting the French coast from the air and by sea. There was absolutely no immediate confirmation that the invasion had started, either from headquarters of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Allied Supreme Commander in the European Theater, or any other Allied quarter. And then the bulletin from Smith goes on to say Londoners and observers on the southeast coast of England said that wave upon wave of Allied air fleets constituting the largest force of bombers and fighters ever seen crossing the English Channel had gone out toward the French coast. Now, if you'll bear with me on this tour of the newsroom, instead of going along in the geographical way I ordinarily would go to the United Press machines, a bulletin just come in on the Associated Press, and here's what it says. New York, June 6, AP, the London radio in a Dutch-language broadcast, warned European underground workers today to report to their leaders with all speed and to, be pre and to be prepared for anything. Keep away from military installations, the broadcast said. Underground members, report to your trusted leaders. Act with speed. Be prepared for anything. There is bombardment in the port of La Havre. That is the bulletin which has just come in on the Associated Press machine. Perhaps you heard those bells ringing in the background as I was reading to you the dispatch from the INS machine, and so I tried not to trip over the cable as I rushed over to the AP machine to read you the bulletin that was coming in there. 
And now back to the United Press machine. That's one of the many United Press machines that we have in this office. Most of them, you know, print the same thing. We have to have a great many copies here at Columbia's news headquarters. The UP machine is next to the INS machine from which I was reading a moment ago. And here is what the UP machine is printing at the moment. The first thing my eye likes on is this. Bulletin, London, June 6, 3.05 in the morning, UP. RAF bombers, quote, in strength, unquote, attacked occupied territory last night. It was announced today. And then, bulletin, second lead, by Joseph W. Grigg, United Press staff correspondent, London, Tuesday, June 6, UP. The German Transocean and DNB agencies started broadcasting shortly after 6.30 in the morning today, European time, 12.30 a.m. Eastern War Time, totally unconfirmed reports that German warships were fighting Allied landing ships around the Seine Estuary, 80 miles from the South England coast, and that Allied paratroops were being landed. Two hours later, while the Germans continued to broadcast the reports in services beamed to foreign stations, but not to listeners in German-dominated Europe, the Supreme Headquarters of General Eisenhower had made no comment. The AP machine has just come in with another bulletin. I've not made my way over to this side of the room again, and it says, Bulletin London, June 6, AP. The Berlin Radio said today that, quote, combined British-American landing operations against the western coast of Europe from the sea and air are stretching over the entire area between Cherbourg and La Havre. Now, there have been two rather late bulletins on the Associated Press. We interrupted the logical order of our tour of the newsroom to rush over to the AP machine. That's the Associated Press machine. And because they were bulletins and were the latest thing to come into our newsroom, although you can hear the clattering of all the other machines in the room, I'd like to read them both to you again, just in case you hadn't quite caught them all. Here's the first one that came in at nine minutes past three in the morning Eastern wartime. New York, the London radio, in a Dutch-language broadcast warned European underground workers today to report to their leaders with all speed and to be prepared for anything. The broadcast said, keep away from military installations. Underground members, report to your trusted leaders. Act with speed. Be prepared for anything. There is bombardment in the port of La Havre. And the second bulletin, the one that came in at 3.11 Eastern Wartime, from London on the Associated Press, the Berlin Radio said today that, quote, combined British-American landing operations against the western coast of Europe from the sea and air are stretching over the entire area between Cherbourg and La Havre. So there we have the latest from the Berlin Radio, which has been putting out uh, these stories, these reports from the very beginning. The latest from the Berlin Radio saying that the landings stretch over the entire area from Cherbourg and La Havre and the latest from uh, London, the BBC, and that Dutch-language broadcast saying there is bombardment in the port of La Havre, which does not necessarily mean an invasion, as you know. Incidentally, if at any time when you, on this little tour of the newsroom, if you can uh, pick out the sounds of the bells in the background, I'd like to explain to you that when you hear five bells in rapid succession... That means that one of our many machines, at least one, is notifying us with the signal of five bells that it has a bulletin on its service wire. Of course, if you suddenly hear all the bells go crazy at once, as if it were Christmas and New Year's all together, that would be a flash. But the flash is not as uh, common in newsrooms as many people who do not work in news sometimes believe. And now I'm back to the United Press machine, where I was in the first place before interrupting to go over to the AP carrying the microphone with me on this long cable, surrounded by colleagues who, most of them, got up out of bed or came in in a hurry when the news came in. And the United Press has a dispatch from Washington, which says, Edward Barrett, executive director of overseas broadcasting for OWI, denied in a long-distance call from New York today that OWI was transmitting German overseas invasion reports back to Germany for German consumption. He said... We don't touch a thing unless and until it is officially announced by Allied headquarters. Well, uh, that just tells us, uh, in a way, something that we might have assumed in the first place, but it does give me a chance to remind you again of uh, one circumstance that might be suspicious, and that is that the German people themselves are not being told of these things as far as we can make out so far these broadcasts of these German uh, reports, if we want to call them that, are all for foreign consumption, and in this case, foreign means us. 
And uh, still continuing, walking about the newsroom, I now come to my colleague, Major George Fielding Elliott, who is standing in his green shirt sleeves, and the pencil is behind his ear. He's working very hard at the moment, and I think he might say something into this portable microphone if I hand it to him. Major? Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, there's only one item of significance in these recent reports, and that is the fact uh, the, this report that there has been a British broadcast in Dutch to the people of Holland ordering the underground leaders, uh, the under the members of the underground, to report to their trusted leaders with all speed. And adding the statement that there is bombardment in the port of Le Havre. Now, if this is a genuine report, it would be unlikely that the British would order the Dutch underground to mobilize and report to their leaders unless there was some serious military operation in the wind. And the statement that there is bombardment in the port of Le Havre, the word bombardment in, uh, in the military technical sense means bombardment by naval vessels and not bombing by aircraft. The word bombing is used when the when attacks by aircraft are meant. However, this should not be accepted as confirmation of the German report until we have a great deal more to go on than this one report of a British broadcast in Dutch to the people of Holland, which may as yet which may turn out to be an unconfirmed or erroneous report. Remember we have nothing to go on yet from any source other than German except this one report, and that is not as yet confirmed from any other source. Now, here again is Bob Trout. Major George Fielding Elliott, whom we encountered on our tour of the newsroom, which was not an unlikely circumstance, has just been telling us some of his latest impressions about the activities here at Columbia's newsroom at, what is it, 3.17 and a half almost in the morning, Eastern wartime. And now, as I am about to pass from one news machine to another to read to you a few more of the bulletins to give you an idea of what does come in on the news machines <clears throat> at this hour, uh, on this kind of night. I uh, just passed by one of the news desks at which one of our Columbia news writers is typing. Perhaps you can hear the rather hesitant pecking in the background. And I see a cable on the desk among the litter of papers paper clips, pen and ink rulers, which reminds me that perhaps you'd like to hear about this cable. About, uh, oh, not quite an hour ago, we got word here in the newsroom that a cable was coming in from London. Well, naturally, all these reports that we've had so far have been coming in from the enemy, so any word from London was a welcome word and perhaps exciting word for us. We waited very eagerly to see what the cable was going to be, and when it came in, it was a cable from Edward R. Murrow in London to Paul White, the director of Columbia's news services here in New York. And this is what it said, London. Paul White, Columbia Broadcasting. Report to the nation, the airplane was named... Let me see now, I can hardly read it myself, it's in Cableese. Report to the nation, the airplane was a new and unnamed B-17. Larry LeSeur and Gene Ryder who installed the gear in this airplane and then test flew it, christened the ship, obviously after Columbia's famous program, Report to the Nation, on account of it would be the first report to the nation from this B-17 plane during a combat mission. Edward R. Murrow in London. Well, that was partly in Cableese and partly was a quick translation. I trust you could understand it. Perhaps I should have explained before I started to read it to you that the cable uh, referred to the uh, flying fortress, the B-17, in which Edward R. Murrow took a trip on a combat mission last week. Was it last week? Yes. Time's rather confused here. Last week to the uh, so-called invasion coast. He broadcast from the plane while it was in flight before it had landed back at its field in England. And he had uh, said on the air several times in his broadcast from the plane in the air that the name of the fortress was Report to the Nation. Naturally, it intrigued our interest, but we were curious to know just how this flying fortress got the name Report to the Nation. Paul White naturally asked Ed Merrill, and this was Edward Merrill's cable. It's a very 
pleasant cable for us to receive, but uh, it's uh, not exactly... <clears throat> It's not exactly the kind of news from London we were expecting when we heard that a cable was coming in from London. Uh, here's the late edition on the Berlin Bulletin that I read to you a moment ago from the Associated Press. My arm is being taken, and I'm going back to the AP machine. An edition on the uh, Bulletin, the Berlin Bulletin I read from the Associated Press. Here's the continuation of it. I trust you remember the beginning. It says, Grand-scale amphibious operations are underway on a broad front between the mouth of the Seine and the estuary of the River Vire, V-I-R-E. A large number of Allied landing boats of various types and light Allied naval forces in considerable strength are taking part, Berlin says. All this is Berlin Radio. This is a continuation. Six heavy Allied warships and 20 Allied destroyers are off the mouth of the Seine. Now, those are the very latest details. They are details from the German radio. Everything that's been coming in is from the German radio as I have told you, and what I gave you then were the very latest details coming in on the Associated Press machine. They are the late details, but they are from Germany, and they are not from the Allies. Columbia Shortwave Listening Station reports that since uh, 1.15 this morning, Eastern War Time, that would be uh, slightly more than two hours ago, Berlin Radio has failed to issue any further word on the invasion of Western Europe. This is just a little slip from our listening station, which has been handed to me, and it says that the British Broadcasting Corporation has not been on the air with any further news whatever since 2.30 this morning. Well, that seems to contradict slightly what I just read. Now, perhaps I better speak to my colleague here, Mr. Jesse Zausmer, who's a little bit nervous of this microphone, I think, but a very capable editor indeed. I just read the bulletin on the Associated Press machine there, Jesse, and uh, then I was just handed this note from our able shortwave listening station boys, and they say that Berlin Radio has not issued any further word and that the BBC has not been on the air since 2.30. So where do you suppose this AP bulletin came from? Well, Bob, I think that the uh, uh, this AP bulletin, which is slugged London, was heard by uh, probably the BBC in London and then sent to us through the usual channels. CBS shortwave listening probably hasn't heard it yet. Uh, our boys and girls back at shortwave are uh, working to get whatever they can get. I know that they're listening to uh, the German broadcasts that are being beamed to uh, Asia and other such spots. The thing that strikes me is that uh, Berlin hasn't said anything yet to the German people. In other words, they're, they're giving us the uh, full story on a story which is just as big for them as it is for us, but uh, the German people don't know anything about it. Now, Bob, suppose yeah, you take uh, over I your think job. Mr. Zausmer always thought he'd be afraid of this microphone if he ever started, but the problem is to get him to stop once he has started. In other words, just to wrap that up for you, the uh, Associated Press Bulletin, which was quoting the Berlin radio, obviously came from the BBC listening station in London. They must have heard one of the German radio outfits broadcasting that. Our Columbia shortwave listening station here in New York has not heard the German radio broadcasting any additional reports since... 1.15 this morning, which was approximately two hours ago. So these late details that we're bringing you, which one of one or another of the many german control radio stations in Europe are putting out, are coming from uh, Germany uh, and are being heard in England by the BBC Monitoring Service and then being cabled from England to New York. I'm back again at the INS machine, International News Service. I don't quite know how it happened because I had in mind just in which direction I was going, but anyway, here I am back because I thought I heard some particular activity on this machine, and it says London, Bulletin, London, June the 6th, INS, the military correspondent of the German agency, DNB, Lieutenant Colonel Alfred von Olberg, today joined numerous of his colleagues in broadcasting the claims that the Allied invasion of Europe has begun. And this is what this Lieutenant Colonel Alfred von Olberg, the military correspondent of the German agency DNB, says, D-Day has dawned. Invasion has begun. The tension which held the whole of Europe in its grip during the past week begins to relax with an Allied landing attempt in northern France. The second front, or better, the third front, has come into being. Well, that's the comment of the military correspondent. We'd call him a military expert, probably or a military analyst, the military correspondent of the German agency, DNB, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Alfred von Olberg. That's what he says. 
The report is Dateline London, and as I was just reminding you a few moments ago, that means that obviously the report was heard in London, was not heard here in New York, was put on the INS machine in London, and that's how we get it here in our in our uh, newsroom in New York. Uh, have you a word? Bob, yes. uh, this is the uh, shortwave summary that uh, Jack Gerber just helped me, and uh, if you can read their notes... Uh, you might want to read what they've taken. I see that this is the BBC in English to the Pacific at 3 o'clock, taken by Myra Jordan. We'll give everybody credit. Well, yeah, thank you, Mr. Zosper. As I uh, was explaining to the audience a moment or two ago, I always thought you told me you'd have microphones right, but I can see that that's not the truth at all. Well, I've just been handed a board. Uh, before I go into this, if you don't mind the informality of this tour of the newsroom, I think I ought to explain that these bulletins, these... Uh, these uh, snatches I've been reading you from the machines, you know, they're coming in constantly. They're being changed. Additional details are being added. Uh, they're being rounded up into better shape. And the purpose of them is, the primary purpose, is that they're, they're coming in to all the uh, afternoon newspaper offices in the country, most of them at the moment. A good many of them are. It depends which service they take. And these newspapers are uh, rewriting these uh, dispatches and uh, getting ready to print them in their afternoon editions. They, uh, some of them are repetitious, naturally. The newspaper editorial rewriting staffs have to work on them, and uh, a good many of them, as I read them to you, do not sound to you, probably, like the language uh, to which you're accustomed when you read your newspaper. But uh, anyway, that's the primary purpose of them. They're, they're coming in all the time. They're being edited, rewritten, analyzed, and put into uh, roundups for the better information of the audience, our radio audience, and also newspaper readers, too. Now now to go into the rough notes of the uh, shortwave listening station, which were just handed to me as I was walking over here by Jesse Zosmer. The BBC in English to the Pacific areas. That's the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, broadcasting from a transmitter somewhere in the British Isles and leaving the broadcast especially to Pacific areas. Broadcast at 3 a.m. That's about 27 minutes ago. And here are the rough notes in the very form in which our shortwave monitors take them down. If, uh, if uh, an item is of enough interest to uh, be sent out, it is usually rewritten and amplified and put into a little better English that is uh, polished up a bit, you know. But here are the rough notes, and this is the way they sound, just to give you another insight into the way a newsroom uh, works, a news headquarters at, at this time. German Overseas Agency stated two hours ago, invasion began. La Havre, parachutes landed on Normandy Peninsula. Spokesman, broadcast warning that a new phase of Allied air offensive began. German Overseas News Agency made this announcement about two hours ago, early this morning, the expected invasion began. When airborne forces were landed in the area of the blank estuary, one word unintelligible. La Havre is at present being exposed to a fierce bombardment. And now as uh, continue on this Early morning newsroom tour, tour of our Columbia newsroom headquarters here in New York. I come up to Ned Calmer, who many of you heard, I hope, broadcasting his regular news program. Well, it was last night, wasn't it? Last night at 11 o'clock Eastern Wartime. Here's Mr. Calmer. Thank you, Bob. Ned Calmer reporting, taking over from Mr. Trout temporarily. First, it might be a good idea... For those who have just tuned in on this exciting night, to go back over the principal facts that we know so far, all of which have been reported to us by the Germans, with the exception of a broadcast by the British Broadcasting Corporation from London in Dutch to Holland, in which the very significant fact is mentioned that the French port of Le Havre is under bombardment. Presumably that means naval bombardment, although there is no specification. Also, in case you missed the start of this broadcast, there is still no Allied confirmation of the German claim that Allied troops have landed anywhere in Western Europe. The... Reports were started at about 11.30, 12.37 this morning with a report from London carried by the Associated Press that the German news agency Transocean 
had announced the Allied invasion had begun. Subsequently, the Germans have been putting out information, or what passes as information, in increasing volume, and both the Associated Press, the United Press, and now the International News Service are devoting practically all of their services to this rapidly developing story. Here's a Berlin bulletin on the Associated Press machine just called my attention. Berlin says that the first center of gravity in these reported military operations is Caen. I'll spell that C-A-E-N, the big city at the base of the Normandy Peninsula in France. The base of this peninsula is 75 miles across between Caen and Avranches. I'll spell that again for those of you who have taken out your maps. A-V-R-A-N-C-H-E-S. The base of this peninsula is 75, 75 miles between Caen and Avranches, and the same distance on a line extending northward to Cherbourg at the tip. Caen itself is 120 miles west northwest of Paris. And now, Mr. Trout, are you ready again? Uh, yes, Mr. Chalmers, thank Trout. you very much. I, uh, not quite up to, uh, up on what Mr. Calmer has been, uh, reading to you from these news machines. Uh, I've now got to the Office of War Information Machine, and that's one of the most interesting, uh, uh, things that's, uh, really observable here in Columbia's newsroom this morning at 3.30. The OWI machine has been almost entirely silent while all the other machines have been hammering out their news. The uh, OWI has put out only one report this morning which says the Romanian radio reports enemy planes over Belgrade. And that report came in at 3.01 in the morning, in other words, about half an hour ago on the OWI wire. It seems that the OWI is waiting cautiously before uh, putting out anything on these German reports. So far, all these reports have been German. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for a special announcement from the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces from London, from Colonel R. Ernest Dupuy. Go ahead, London. This is Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force. The text of communique number one will be released to the press and radio of the United Nations in 10 seconds. Repeat, 10 seconds from now. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The communique will be repeated. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This ends the reading of communique number one from Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force. This means invasion. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are back at Columbia's news headquarters, the newsroom in New York. I've just taken the microphone out of the studio again and back into our news headquarters. You have just heard from London Colonel R. Ernest Dupuy of the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces reading Communique No. 1. Everything to this point has been German reports, and Communique No. 1 now says, under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. It is now official. The landings have begun. And at this moment, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. As you just heard from Mr. Trout, the period of doubt is at an end, and we have official announcement of the landing of Allied armies 
on the northern coast of France. As uh, there is nothing to add to the very bare words of the official communique, it was to be expected that the Allied naval forces would cover the landing and would be engaged in conveying our troops to the coast of France and that there would be strong air support. When there is any further details to give you, we will bring them to you promptly and we'll try to analyze them for you as well as we can within the limits of the information that we get from time to time. Now, here again is Mr. Trout. Major George Fielding Elliott has been speaking to you, talking about the uh, invasion. I think we can now call it that. Following the reading of the first communique, communique number one from SAFE. That's what we call Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces somewhere in Great Britain. Uh, rather strangely, you know, just before we switched to London to hear the first communique, we were making this uh, informal tour of the Columbia Newsroom, which began at 3 o'clock in the morning, 35 minutes ago. I was standing here in front of the OWI machine and telling you that while all the other news services, the UP, AP, INS, Reuters, all the rest, were sending out all these reports and from uh, Europe, you know, about the German reports, the OWI, which uh, confines itself to official news sends us the text of the communiques and all that sort of thing. The OWI was printing almost nothing, and uh, since the beginning of the day, since midnight, the OWI had put on only one bulletin, or rather one a dispatch of any kind, saying that the Romanian radio reported enemy planes over Belgrade. And, of course, a few moments after I said that, uh, we switched you to London so that you could hear Colonel Dupuy reading the communique, and of course at that moment, uh, after I came out of the studio on the OWI machine, here is what is now printed. OWI 2, meaning the second bulletin since midnight. OWI 2, flash. Supreme Headquarters announces Allies begin operations on northern coast of France. Bulletin. Communique said, under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. 3.34 p.m. Eastern Wartime from Washington. That's what the Office of War Information wire says. Uh, still uh, looking over the machines now in a way. It's rather speculative. The, the whole character of this broadcast has changed, and it did change rather abrupt, abruptly. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, if you have been uh, staying with us, you know we started... Uh, Oh, sometime uh, after midnight, I guess it was about 20 minutes to 1 in the morning, Eastern War Time, when the Germans began putting these reports out. We've been bringing you frequent reports. And then at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, a little more than 35 minutes ago, we took this microphone here in our studio, which adjoins the Columbia Newsroom in New York, and uh, brought it out here to the news machines and began taking you on an informal tour to show you what a newsroom is like at this hour. And now I hear that we must go to London in a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, for a broadcast from Columbia's correspondent, Edward R. Murrow, we take you now to London. I'll march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will get the German war machine the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeat in open battle man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. We've inflicted upon the Germans great defeat in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck. 
And let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. This order was distributed to assault elements after their embarkation. It was read by appropriate commanders to all other troops in the Allied Expeditionary Force. I return you now to the United States. Well, as a matter of fact, we have to come into the studio now with this unusual arrangement so that we can hear the speaker and hear what Mr. Merrill was saying. That was Edward R. Merrill, Columbia's correspondent in London. Now we're back out in the newsroom with our long cable, and once again, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. The Allied invasion of Western Europe, as you know, has begun. Such an operation, carrying thousands and hundreds of thousands of troops across water to land them on a hostile shore, is one of the most dangerous of all military operations. There have been few such vast military amphibious operations in all history. Some have failed, but some have succeeded. And no such operation has ever been prepared with the thoroughness of this Allied landing on the European continent. The Allies have been getting ready for it for years. The British have been looking forward to this day ever since Dunkirk. And the moment the United States got into the war, our military leaders realized that the main road to the defeat of Germany lay through the occupied lands of Western Europe, and they began to plan accordingly. Our leaders have also realized that they must strike with overwhelming force. In some military operations, an initial repulse might have little effect. But in this European invasion, it might be fatal, for it would be a disastrous blow to the morale of the people of the conquered nation. So, the plans for the invasion were more complex and more complete than any that military strategists have ever had to work out before. Germany's dash across the Low Countries and France was simple in comparison. So was the German attack on Russia, vast as that operation was. The Allied landings in North Africa and in Sicily involved similar problems to this one, but they were on a far smaller scale. The opposition was much lighter. Nevertheless, the experience gained in these operations has been invaluable in planning for this one. We don't know as yet the details of the first landing operation, but usually an invasion force strikes in three waves. First comes the assault force, which is composed mainly of infantry, supported sometimes by light tanks, and usually also including assault engineers. Its job is to strike quickly, to break up initial enemy resistance, and to secure a foothold on the shore. Before it can land, have the support of bombing and fighting planes and of naval artillery. And you will remember that General Eisenhower's first communique emphasized the strong naval and air support which our landing was receiving. How quickly these first waves can get ashore depends on the strength of the enemy's defenses and on the effectiveness with which those defenses are reduced by bombardment. We take you now, in a few moments, for another broadcast uh, to the British Isles. In a moment or two, our signal will be ready. We take you now to London. Here is the text of a report sent to London by Herbert M. Clark for the networks of the United States. This is Herbert M. Clark in a takeoff report from an Allied expeditionary base. I don't have to explain what the takeoff is. When you hear this, you'll know that Allied forces have leaped the gap between the bases in the United Kingdom and the coast of France. We'll be there, and we'll be there to stay as you listen. As I write this, we're in an unnamed port on an unnamed coast, one of the quirks of military security. But it's a funny thing about security. A week ago in London, I was in a state of constant irritation with security censorship. It was obvious from German radio reports that the Nazis knew things we knew but couldn't say. Since then, I've been living and eating and sleeping aboard the flagship of an allied assault force, one of the several which are going to hit the Hun where he hurts most. And I find that Jerry knows less 
than he said he did. Since I've been here, we've had exactly one air alarm, and that not a raid or even a determined reconnaissance. And I also find that I don't object so much to security. My loyalty and responsibility to you back home is overridden by loyalty and responsibility to the soldiers on this boat and the sailors who are carrying them to the beachhead. That objective is also, for the moment, unidentifiable, because the place we've picked for our main landing is one Jerry hadn't figured on. And I don't want to be the one to tell him that our sector is the one where his counterattack should go. The Nazis have been badly outguessed on this whole show. He's going to be surprised by the direction of the attack, and he's going to get a shock by the timing. The master race has fallen down again. I'm treating all this from the past tense as though it hadn't already, as though it had already happened. Maybe that's a mistake, but it's a reflection of the overwhelming confidence of the troops involved and the confidence I've drawn from the tremendous scale of the preparation. We haven't yet moved from our anchorage, but all morning this coastal strip has been full of movement. Ladies and gentlemen, I will digress to say that the next few sentences will be semi English that uh, the script has been censored. There are ships in the task forces which are striking, British, Canadian, and American. They range from big troop carriers and supply ships down to landing craft. Other vessels, landing craft, which make most of the journey, piggyback on bigger ships, are in the fleet. Now I admit that I can't conceive of a fleet of ships myself, but I do know that's as far as I can see from the bridge of this ship. Others are dotting the water thickly, and I can see about 30 square miles of water. Well, ships, I'm told, half the force. Double it, and you'll have the whole. And they're all loaded with fighting men and fighting weapons, some of them still secret. For some hours, the vanguard of our force assigned to deal with specific coastal objectives in our sector of Nazi Europe and landing craft lumbering through a choppy sea so slowly that they must start well ahead of time to get to their assigned places at their appointed times, these ships have been moving out. I'm speaking to shore by the last available channel of communication. We'll be following those ships soon, and I hope to be back with you before long with some harder facts. This is Herbert Clark reporting from the flagship of an Allied assault invasion force for the networks of the United States. I return you now to the United States. Once again in the studio, adjoining Columbia's newsroom at Columbia's news headquarters in New York City, this is Bob Trout speaking again. And now, once again, you'll hear the noise of the bells as I open the door, take the microphone out on the long cable to the newsroom itself. That seems to be the quickest way to get the news to you as it's coming in so rapidly. We started this as a very informal tour about 45 minutes ago when uh, we didn't know that it was invasion. As a matter of fact, the Germans were the only people who had been uh, putting out the reports. And uh, in a few moments, I'd like to sort of sum the thing up for you so we can see where we are at the moment. But uh, it seems that uh, it's the, the story is now at this stage at which interruptions come. Things come in so quickly that it's uh, almost impossible to find time to go back and sum up. We've had the first dispatch from London. We sometimes have to interrupt each other here during this uh, informal broadcast. When we get word to switch rapidly to London, there are only a few seconds in which to do it. And so... Uh, our broadcast may be abrupt at some point or another, but we're trying to keep you abreast of the news as quickly as possible. And so when we get word that London has something, we just cut whatever we can and go as quickly as possible. Now, I think perhaps the, uh, the best uh, way to uh, uh, get up to date, to bring us up to date here from the, uh, from the exciting moment, the supreme and moment of suspense at which... Uh, Colonel Dupuy announced in London that this really was an invasion and not just a German trick. I think the best way to bring us ourselves up to date is to go back to this Associated Press machine in front of which I'm...